so that should now be recording. And I will also try and share my screen with you. Those are the three things that I need to remember to do. Um, how's that looking? There we go. Good, good, good. All right. Okay, so this morning's talk um, is on uh, the legacy of the Norman Kingdom in Palermo. Um, it was seen as the jewel in Sicily's crown, lasting from the end of the 11th century till the end of the 12th century, just over 130 years. The Normans left us with some of the finest churches that we have in the whole of Sicily. And most of them are in the city of Palermo. And absolutely justifiably, um, we can dedicate a, a, a talk just to those churches in Palermo. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start off giving you a little bit of background into how the Normans arrived in Sicily and what they were doing in Sicily and when they came to Sicily. And then um, I'll give you a little bit of an overview on who the kings were, who were the main players in our story. And then we'll go and look at um, <clears throat> four fabulous architectural gems in the city of Palermo. So that's the plan for, for this morning's talk. So without any ado, let's start. Let's look at the situation. Um, this is the situation at the beginning of the 11th century in southern Italy. And the first question we have to ask ourselves is, who were the Normans? Where did they come from? And what were they doing here? Well, <clears throat> Norman just means Norse man, <clears throat> coming from the north. And uh, they came originally, they were Vikings. They had come from what is nowadays Norway in the ninth century and settled in northern France in the region that we now call Normandy. So it all, all fits together, all to do with North, Norse, Norman. Now, these Normans, uh, they were warriors, they were fighters. They were not farmers. They didn't have land in any way. So somehow they had to, they had to make themselves felt. But they were very, very entrepreneurial and they were extremely intelligent. What they did is they um, let themselves out as mercenaries to dukes and kings throughout Europe. And that was how they came to be in southern Italy it, at the end of the 10th century. So in 999, we find themselves, we find them being, um, letting themselves out as mercenaries to the dukes of Salerno. Now, um, there are several other things here as well, because these Normans were very devout Christians and they made pilgrimages to Jerusalem. In the 10th century, the route to Jerusalem from Northern Europe was to come down the Italian peninsula and catch a boat either from Bari or from Brindisi. So that's how they would have arrived in, in Puglia. But not only that, in this area of Italy, uh, which we call the Gargano, there is a shrine to the arch archangel, archangel, I was about to say, Michael. Saint Michael is the patron saint of knights. So this gave the Normans, if you like, it was a, a 10th century uh, tour. <laughs> they came down, they hired themselves out to the Dukes of Salerno as, as mercenaries. They went to pay their respects to St. Michael, <clears throat> and then they went off to Jerusalem. At that time in the 10th century, Sicily was under Arab rule. Um, <clears throat> what the Arabs had done, they had 
divided the, the, the region of Sicily into three triangles. Um, and each of them was ruled over by an emir. Incidentally, it has to be said while we're on that, emir is where we get our English word admiral from, because through Norman Sicilian, emir, emiraglio, admiral. So these are the things that, that came to us from, from Norman Sicily. Anyway, um, so the emirs were in Sicily at this time, but they were starting to squabble amongst themselves. And they too called on help from some of these Norman knights to come and help them. And it was in 1060 that two Norman knights, um, Roger and his brother, brother Robert Altavilla, um, crossed over into Sicily and notionally they were fighting for the, uh, for the emirs, but they looked around and they saw what, what, what riches Sicily had to offer and they liked it and they decided that they wanted to come back and gain it from the, for themselves. So in 1061, Roger and Robert Altavilla landed in Messina. It took them 10 years before they finally arrived in Palermo. I think this date is actually wrong. I don't think it's 1072. I think it, they finally arrived in 1070, but they didn't actually um, successfully conquer it until 1071. Um, now, the other thing about this conquest um, to be said, we are talking about very tiny numbers of Norman knights. We're talking about probably a couple of hundred of Norman knights and maybe three or four hundred foot soldiers. How did they manage to conquer this vast island? Well, that's part of the reason why it did actually take them 10 years. I mean, it, it really was a difficult um, uh, thing to do. Well, um, what the Normans did, and they were very, very intelligent about it, they, um, they simply um, allowed life to carry on as normal, and they ruled over them, they married into the aristocracy, they learnt the language, and carried off the spoils of whatever they, they could. Um, but they were very tolerant of the people that they ruled over. So they started off by conquering one town after another um, through the, these are the Nebridi Mountains here in the north of Sicily, until finally, as I said, in 1070, they arrived in Palermo. <clears throat> 1071, Palermo was under their rule. So Norman rule in Sicily begins in 1071. At that point, um, the elder brother, Robert, goes back to Puglia and he leaves Sicily in the hands of his son, Roger. Uh, now, this table here is the names of the Norman kings with the dates that they ruled. Basically, it's very easy. There are only four Norman kings because we can pretty much discount Tancredi. Um, he was the last Norman king. He wasn't even in Sicily. He was back in Puglia. I just put him down there for the sake of completion. Um, and it's very easy with the Norman kings. They're either called Roger or they're called William. <laughs> so you can't, um, you can't mistake them. Um, the important thing to remember is that Roger II was actually the first Norman king and he wasn't crowned until 1130. That's because Sicily was not a kingdom until 1130. It was just a dukedom. What happened was that um, Roger II was very, very lucky or possibly very cunning. Um, around this time was the time that the popes themselves were squabbling among themselves. Um, it was the time when we had an anti-pope, uh, St. Anacletius, and Roger was very lucky, he backed the anti-pope um, to become pope, and when the pope did so, he, um, he reiterated by 
crowning Roger king of Sicily and making Sicily into a kingdom. But that was only from 1130. Up until 1130, it was only a dukedom. So Roger I ruled as um, actually as a count. And for the first 25 years of his life, Roger II ruled um, just as, as a duke, actually. Um, but then in deference to his father, when he took the crown, he named himself Roger II and called his father Roger I. So slightly complicated, but that's the reason behind it. Um, William I really only ruled for just over 10 years and he doesn't really enter into our story today. So we can pretty much discount him. We're going to talk quite a lot about William II because he was important at the end of our story when we come to Bonreale. We're also going to talk a lot about Roger II because he was the great Norman king. But let's just start off by um, mentioning Roger I. So to go back to his arrival in Palermo in 1071, he really consolidated the Norman rule in Sicily. Um, he also uh, invaded Tunisia, so they began to, um, to, to take on lands from North Africa. Malta as well at this time fell under the Norman rule. But what happened to the locals who were here under the Arabs? Well, life carried on absolutely as, norm as normal. Um, the, the Arabs carried on with their agriculture. The Greeks, who were the great sailors at this time, carried on sailing across the, 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 the Mediterranean. The Jews, who were the great merchant class, carried on trading. And the great thing that Roger I did was he allowed all of this to continue. Now, it has to be said that Sicily was very lucky at this time because being in the center of the Mediterranean, it was growing rich. And by the end of the 11th century, century it was the richest island in the, 11th, in the whole of the Mediterranean. So these people had no need to rebel about against their new ruler, Roger, because they were quite simply, they were busy getting rich. And all Roger did was simply rule over them, make sure that every, everything went all right, protected them and just took a nice, um, a nice um, sample of, of, of their riches. And that was how he was able to go on and build some of these fabulous Norman um, churches that we are going to to go and, and look at. So the first one was um, what we call the Norman Palace. Now um, this stunning looking building, um, which it has to be said it's, it's more impressive from the outside possibly than the inside. Uh, the inside has been altered an, an awful lot and there are a couple of very impressive rooms inside of it but a lot of it is, 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 is nowadays, is, is, is offices for the Sicilian Regional Assembly. Now, this building um, was originally an Arab castle and it stood on the highest part of Palermo, um, actually on the city walls, on the outside of the, of the city. Roger took this over because he knew that from this building, he could survey the whole of the city of Palermo. Um, and he made it into to the, the, the Norman palace that we, we have today. So as I say, there's really only two, build, two rooms in this palace that actually interest us. And the first of these is the chapel, the royal chapel. This is known as the Palatine chapel or the chapel of Peter and Paul and it's built over um, prior to this there was there was a there was another chapel underneath it which now functions as the crypt and Roger built this rather wonderful um, 
sorry, I'm going ahead of myself here. <laughs> this was Roger's son, Roger II, who built this absolutely superb chapel. Now, it's really very hard to, to, to get um, a feel of just in photographs. Um, <clears throat> ignore um, what you can see here in the middle of the photograph, because this is actually a restoration. Um, but what I've done is tried to give you an idea of the, 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 the apps as you walk into to the, to the chapel. But as I say, it really doesn't do the, the whole chapel justice. But what it does do is it shows you that the interior of the chapel is decorated with gold mosaics. And this is the thing that um, people are stunned by when they walk into the chapel. So last week we, we, we talked about the Roman mosaics in the Roman villa. These are very different mosaics. These are made with little tiny piece of uh, ceramic mainly, possibly stone, but with the addition of gold leaf. This is pure gold leaf that we are looking at here. And it has this beautiful shining quality. Um, I never even remember the numbers of how much gold is used here, but it's something quite extraordinary. The other thing to note, let's move on to the next slide. <clears throat> the other thing to note is the inscriptions in the church. The writing here is in Greek. The angels here, these are Greek decorations. Christ here, this is what this is in a Greek pose, what we, we know of as the Greek, um, the Christ Pantocrator, the all powerful um, Orthodox Greek Christ. This is, this is Greek. This is not Latin at all. What, what is going on here? Well, this is an interesting question because um, here we are at the date of this is about 1140. The schism between the Eastern Church and the Western Church had only happened about 60 years before. And here in Palermo, people still spoke Greek. Greek was very much the lingua franca of the church. So that was one reason why uh, Greek was, the Greek model was used. But the other reason was because at this time, Greek art was thought to be the highest form of art in the Mediterranean. And these Norman kings wanted to impress. They wanted to show off the wealth that they were amassing at this time. So that's why they, they chose that. Um, just a couple of things to point out before we move on to the next slide. So as I said, the, the angels are um, Greek. They are, we can say Byzantine. Byzant when I say, we say Byzantine, we mean Greek, of course. Um, you can see that they have these wings. These are just the kind of um, wings that you see if you go to some of the Orthodox churches in modern day uh, Istanbul or Constantinople. Um, as I said, the inscription around Christ is in Greek. This is telling us when the um, church was built. These letters here, ICXC, again, this is Greek. This is the Greek initials for Jesus Christ. And also you see this orthodox symbology here in his finger is that it takes a little bit of imagination, but he, this, what he is, um, the symbol that he is making here is he is spelling out the letters of I, C, X, C. So he's spelling out the initials of his name with his fingers. This was the orthodox symbology of, of, of Christ. <clears throat> so 
lots and lots of Greek uh, symbolism here in in this in this in this mosaic. And we'll talk more about the the these these mosaics in a moment, but just for the time being, I want to move on to another part of this church, which is possibly even more incredible. And that is the ceiling. Here we are. Now, actually, uh, we see this better in photographs than we see in, in real life, because when you're there in real life, it's a little bit dark and it's, it's up high above you and it's difficult to see. Um, but with a photograph, we're able to zoom in and I can show you something that I think is absolutely extraordinary. So the form of this ceiling is what we call mukarnas. And mukarnas is an Arabic word. It's an Arab style of architecture. And it basically, um, it's, a, it's a style of vaulting. So it's a way of creating a roof. Very simply, it solves an architect architectural problem. How do you have a square room and a circular dome on top of that? How do you move from square to a circle? And the, the answer that the Arabs came up with is this, what we call mukarnas, this um, successive, um, um, as you see, tiny little, little shapes, these little vaults, um, gradually moving to a, not quite a circle, but you will see it's an octagon. Now, an octagon or an octagonal star, an eight-pointed star. The eight-pointed star was the Arabic star. And if you look closely at this ceiling, there are further clues that give this away. The writing around this is in what we call Kufic calligraphy. It's in Arabic. We can't actually, uh, very frustrating, we can't actually read what it says. We can't, we can't decipher it, but we do know that it's in Arabic. Um, nevertheless, we're absolutely certain of that. So this beautiful ceiling um, is made, actually, I didn't say this, but I should have done. It's made of wood, fir wood, which comes from the Madonia Mountains in northern Sicily, and it is painted, it's decorated, and it all would have been made by Arab craftsmen. Just to look further into the detail, here we go. Look, this is the close-up of one of these octagonal stars. You can see the beautiful calligraphic script here going around the outside. If you look even closer though, Look here. Now, how many of you have learnt from school or whatever that in Arab art, they never portrayed people? It was all um, geometric designs. Well, yes, that's true. Until you come to the Palatine Chapel in Palermo and here you see figures. You see women unveiled, drinking, wine. So here we are in the Palatine Chapel, a Christian church, we have Arab figures here sitting drinking wine, which is absolutely extraordinary, just showing the tolerance that these Norman kings, these Norman rulers had for their subjects. Um, another detail here, this, uh, this, this is a lovely one here, I can't really tell what he's doing, just sitting cross-legged, maybe this is a a wise man listening to his counsel or whatever. But everywhere you look in this ceiling, you see extraordinary figures. Here, this looks as if this man has a, a turban on his head. Um, more uh, Cufic calligraphy here, you can see. An utterly stunning jewel. And I think it's worth traveling to Sicily just to see this ceiling. Okay, so that's the Palatine Chapel. The other beautiful room in the Palatine, the Norman Palace, is 
the throne room of Roger II. Now, um, this also has beautiful um, mosaics in it, again made of, of gold. And this room is the only room that we have in Sicily of non-religious mosaics. So non depicting non-religious subjects, I mean. So as you can see, it's depicting hunting. This is what the Norman kings liked doing. But the interesting thing here is the design of this. This is not a Norman design. This is not a Greek design at all. Can you see it's symmetrical? We have symmetrical creatures. We have these peacocks. Where did the peacocks come from? That's another clue. We have these cranes here, date palms. This design is Persian. And where would the Normans have got this design from? Well, probably the, the clue is that going back to the Jewish merchants, the Greek merchants, they traded in silk, which was coming from Constantinople, came through the city of Palermo, and they were selling it on to northern Italy and making a huge profit and making a lot of money. And these silks would have had these beautiful Persian designs on it. This is how the Norman kings got these designs. They copied the designs and they used them in their throne room. So again, this amazing story of um, cross-cultural fertilization happening here in, in, um, in the Norman palace. I could talk all day about the Norman palace, but um, let's move on to some of the other beautiful buildings in um, in in Palermo. The other one I want to talk about, um, which is contemporary with the Palatine Chapel, is um, the Martorana Church. This also um, was built in the reign of Roger II. Um, so again, you can see very similar kind of thing. You can see the um, Byzantine angels. You can see the Greek inscription. You can see the Christ Pantocrator as well. Um, also some very beautiful scenes in the Martorana church. Um, this is a scene of the nativity. Again, beautiful gold uh, leaf tessere. We have the names of the Greek saints or kings around it. Um, but this is what I really want to look at. This is beautiful. The scene of the nativity, the baby Jesus being born, and the light of the Holy Spirit shining down onto him. And the Virgin Mary dressed as a Byzantine queen. She has this Byzantine veil around her, her face. And then, of course, the angel, angels Gabriel and um, Michael would be near here. And St. Peter sitting by as well here. Um, we'll go on to another beautiful scene in the, in the Martorana is this one. This, is, this leaps forward to, um, actually, this is the deathbed of the Virgin Mary. And we have, so she's, she's lying, dying on her deathbed. She's, she has Christ at her deathbed, and Christ is holding up her soul. So this, this is the Virgin Mary twice. Um, he's holding up her soul and lifting it up, carrying it up into heaven. And they are surrounded by the apostles. You can identify Peter here and, and Paul here. But the interesting person here is this chap here. This chap here has been identified as um, George of Antioch. Now, this is why I told you the story of the Emir and the Amiraglio at the beginning of the talk, because George was the admiral or the Ammiraglio of Roger's navy. Now, this is an, a curious thing, actually, because these um, 
these Norman knights, they were, they were mercenaries, they were soldiers. They didn't know how to sail. They didn't have any boats. They had to get the Greeks to, 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 to man their navy for them. And the head of the Greek navy was this chap, um, George, the Amiral of Antioch, who obviously became massively rich and built this church and dedicated it to the Virgin Mary. In fact, the next mosaic I want to show you is a, um, a mosaic in the church. Um, again, the Virgin Mary holding up, this is in Greek, the dedication of the church. And here we are, look, this is the Admiral again, but look how he's cowering um, at the feet of the Virgin Mary, dedicating his church to her. And I want to show you this uh, mosaic because on the opposite wall, we see this mosaic. And this is something really quite extraordinary. Now, I mentioned that, so this is, this is Roger II being crowned king. He was crowned king in 1130. This mosaic dates from the 1140s, 1142, 1145, something like that. He is dressed in the clothes of a Byzantine emperor. He's styling himself on the Byzantine emperors. He's only been crowned king for 10 years. He's been crowned king, not by the Pope, or by the bishop, but by Christ himself. Normally, being crowned king, he would be kneeling down. Here he's standing up. He's almost the same height as Christ. If you look carefully, they even have almost the same face. This is, this is, we have to say, this is just about the only portrait that we have of Roger II, but he's portraying himself as being like Christ. So possibly even more important than the Byzantine emperors. Something quite extraordinary is going on here. And if you think this is only 70 years after his father arrived to conquer Palermo. Curiosity here, if you look at this name, um, this is in Latin, but written in the Greek alphabet. <laughs> So I always think this is quite strange. It says Rugerus Rex, which is Latin, but written in Greek letters. So just to show that um, the two languages, Latin and Greek, absolutely coincided side by side in Pumbi Palermo. And just finally, before we leave the Martorana, uh, this is one of the columns in the Martorana with this beautiful um, Arab inscription um, from the Quran. This is actually a, a pillar that would have been taken from a mosque. So they're reusing um, architectural elements here. Um, I don't want to talk very much about it actually in my talk today, uh, the cathedral in Palermo. The cathedral in Palermo is a Norman building uh, or at least it dates from Norman times, but there's not very much of the Norman cathedral left there. This tower is Norman, this very, very lovely tower. The nave is also Norman. These battlements, for example, these are, are Norman. And also these windows here, it's very hard to see in this photograph. These are Norman, um, Norman arches. But Everything else that you see here has been added on later, um, especially this dome, which was added on in the 18th century. And the interior of the, the um, Cathedral of Palermo is neoclassical. It's not at all what you would expect. Um, so I don't really want to dwell on the cathedral, except to, to say two things. Um, firstly, that Roger II is buried here, and you can go visit his tomb if you like. The other thing to say is that, of course, um, Palermo had a bishop and it was therefore a diocese. It, 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 
created it, it had its own diocese. Now, um, we're going to fast forward in a moment and we're going to Roger's grandson, William II, and we're going to go and look at the building that he built, which is the Cathedral of Monreal, which is an absolutely, absolute jewel. But I want to explain how the Cathedral of Monreale came into, into being, because the question that people ask is, why do you want two cathedrals so close to each other? Well, um, the point was in medieval times, of course, that the bishop was a very, very powerful man. He was more powerful than the king. And here in Palermo and in the time of the Norman kings, the bishops were rising to power. And the Norman kings wanted in some way to subdue this. Roger II had done something very, very clever when he obtained the, the, the throne from the Pope. He also obtained the right to appoint his own bishops. Now that's something that no king in medieval times usually could do. Usually it was only the, the Pope that could appoint bishops. So um, we, we fast forward um, 30 years to Roger II's grandson, William. And William was becoming irked by the Bishop of Palermo. He wanted he wanted to be rid of him, but he couldn't do it. He couldn't find a way around it. So he found a solution. He went to Monreale. Now Monreale just means royal mountain, Monte Reale, which in these times was simply the place where the Norman kings went to do their hunting. And while he was out hunting, he, he got tired and he fell asleep under a tree against a stone. And while he was sleeping, he was visited in his dream by the Virgin Mary. And she told him that when he awoke, if he dug underneath the stone, he would find enormous riches of gold. So that's exactly what he did. He dug under the stone and he found all the gold. And the Virgin Mary told him that with all this gold, he should build a cathedral to her up in Monreale. And that's exactly what he did. And being a cathedral of talk as well, he was able to install his own bishop and create his own diocese. And hence, this was the way that the Norman kings were able to counter the power of the uh, bishop down in Palermo. So this is what he did. He built this cathedral in Palermo, in Monreale. It, the work started in 1170. Poor old William died in 1189. This cathedral was completed in less than 20 years. If you think about it for a medieval building, that is quite extraordinary. It is utterly unprecedented. Unfortunately, it does show it a little bit when you look on the outside. The outside has clearly been thrown together. Um, but the inside is pure spectacle. And it's the inside where we spend most of our time in our visit. But just before we do go inside, I do want to show you the apse at the back of the cathedral. This is, this is typically Norman. <clears throat> Um, and this is rather lovely. Look at this pattern of interlacing arches. And what's typical about these arches is that they're not the rounded arches of the Normans that we know in Britain. <clears throat> so think of Durham Cathedral and so forth. Um, but they are pointed arches, not the absolute pointed arches of the Arabs, but somewhere in between. This is typical of Sicilian Arab architecture. But if we go inside, we see um, the absolutely stunning um, gold mosaics. Um, 
which were created by William II. So this Christ Pantocrator measures six meters from one side to the other. He's looking down on the congregation and it's said that wherever you sit in the church, he is looking down on you. Um, he's performing the blessing, just as we showed in the Palatine Chapel, and he's dressed in the um, robes of the Orthodox Pantocrator. Um, his name is in Greek here, the IC, the XC that we saw before, but also we can read in Greek, it's his Panto Krator, Pantocrator, and he's holding in his hand um, a page from the Bible, um, a verse of St. John, which says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never be in darkness. It's difficult to see here, but if you look, one page is, of that is in Latin, the other page is in Greek. Again, the two languages existing side by side here in the church. Um, this is a, another view of this, the inside of the apse. So here we are, we're up on the inside of, of this, basically, is just to give you, get your bearings. Um, beneath the Christ Pantocrator, we have the Virgin Mary, again, dressed in Byzantine robes, holding Christ. We have the um, Byzantine archangels here. So we have, this is Gabriel, Michael, and then they're flanked by, this is St. Paul and St. Peter. And these are other apostles here. But I want to talk for a moment about these guys down here. These guys are all martyrs. These are Christian martyrs. Um, many of them are bishops as well. You can see they've got bishops mitre on here. But the one I want to mention is this chap here. Um, if we can zoom in and have a look at him. We can uh, identify his name. If you, so this is, this is not Greek, this is in Latin, Sanctus, T-H-O, M, just cut off, Mass, Canterbury. This is St. Thomas of Canterbury. This is the earliest portrait that we have of St. Thomas of Canterbury, St. Thomas of Becket. What on earth is it doing here in the Cathedral of Monreale? Well, um, King William II had married the da daughter of Henry II of England, Joanna. Henry II was the one who had ordered the murder or the assassination of Thomas of Becket. So what is the message here? The message is to the, to the Bishop of Palermo. It's saying, you remember that guy Thomas back in England? He disobeyed the king. You remember what happened to him? He was put to the sword. If you don't obey me, the same thing will happen to you. And that's, that's the message of, 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 the, um, of, of all, the, um, all the mosaics in this church. They are mosaics just to, to show the power of these Norman kings. Um, I've got one more here. This is jumping around a little bit. So this is the coronation of William II. Again, being crowned by Christ, not by the bishop um, or the Pope. Christ is actually sitting down in this one. Again, um, William II standing up, dressed in these fabulous ro robes of a Byzantine emperor. Um, quite an extraordinary statement, um, I think, this. So, um, we're almost coming to the end. Um, just to round off, we, we, we do have to say, 
what then happened to, to these Norman kings? They left us this incredible legacy of the finest churches in Sicily and probably the finest Norman churches anywhere in the world. Well, poor old William, uh, he made three terrible mistakes in his life. The first one was that he died young. I suppose that wasn't really his fault. The second one was that he died without leaving an heir. Um, so Joanna, his wife, was very, very young. Um, she, never, she, she never left, she never gave him any issue. Um, nice to say, actually, that Joanna, actually, after the death of William, went off. She became a queen in, in France and then did have children and, and carried on ruling in France. But the Norman line came to an end with William II. But William made a terrible mistake. Um, the other great power in Europe at this time was the um, Holy Roman Emperors. These were the kings of Germany, Frederick Barbarossa. And Frederick Barbarossa asked for the hand in marriage for his son, Henry, the hand of an aunt of William II, um, a woman named Constance. So when William II died, Henry and Constance, who at that time were childless, but they jolly well made sure that they had children afterwards, they, um, they had children and the crown passed by that way to basically the Holy Roman Empires, em emperors. Um, we call them the, 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 the Hohenstaufen family, the, the Swabians, um, which is the subject of another lecture. Um, but unfortunately, with William, the, the, um, the, the Norman rule in Sicily came to an end. Um, so with this building of Monreale Cathedral, really all our wonderful building is, is completed. Well, I think I've slightly gone over, but we've left uh, 10 minutes at the end for our uh, questions. So I'm going to unmute you. Um, by all means, feel free to um, unmute yourselves. And um, and we can have some questions from anybody that that would like to to ask a question. But I mean, just wave your hand, put your hand up, shout out. Anybody? Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, Anne. Hello there, Anne. Nice to see Hello. you. Yes, Hello. Anne. Fire away. My question is to do with the church at the beginning and the language was both in Latin and Greek and it struck me what happened well two questions really what happened to the Arab language did it disappear and what happened to the Arabs themselves did they just disappear both very very good questions and I, I, I and I wish I really had more time to talk about that um, just outside that church is an inscription and it's an inscription that was on a clock. And it's an inscription that's in three languages. Um, and in a way that would have been a better illustration of my point than the inscription that I showed you. Because the three languages are Latin, Greek, and Arabic. And um, what's really interesting about that inscription is that the three um, scripts actually say three different things. They were not translations of the Latin. So it wasn't as if Latin was the most important and then we translated into the other languages. These languages absolutely coexisted at the same time. So Latin was absolutely um, the, an integral language to the city of Palermo. Now, I mean, I could talk even more, I could talk all day about this because later, in the, um, now you will know this <laughs> actually being in Spain because it was a very similar thing to what was happening in Spain because the Arab mathematicians came to the court in Palermo 
to, to talk about all their mathematical uh, treatises and so forth. And of course, they were talking in Arabic. So Sicily and of course also southern Spain were the only two places in Europe where we had people who were able to understand these Arab mathematicians and so on. And this became very, very important um, for medieval European mathematics. All the European mathematicians from Tuscany and so forth got their maths from southern Spain and, and Palermo. So Arabic was an absolutely integral language to, to the court of, of Sicily. But your other question was, what happened to the Arabs? Well, um, that's a bit of a sad story, unfortunately, um, because um, we need to fast forward um, quite a long way, unfortunately, into the rule of William II's um, great nephew, I suppose it was, Frederick II. Now, Frederick II was descended partly from the Normans via um, his great-grandmother or his grandmother Constance, but partly also from the Hohenstaufens. So he was part German, part Arabic. He was a very, very clever king, but he ruled over too much. He ruled over Sicily, he ruled over the whole of what is nowadays Italy, and he ruled over half of Germany. And he's, although he was a very clever ruler, so we're talking the first half of the 13th century. Um, although he was a very able ruler, he spent much of his rule away from Sicily, fighting causes in the Italian peninsula. And there were uprisings and there were things started to go wrong in Sicily. And in 1240 something, I forget the exact date, he dispelled the Arabs from Sicily. He, moved, he forcibly moved them to other parts of the Italian peninsula, to, um, to um, Puglia, for example. And this was a disaster for Sicily because the Arabs were so important to, to, the, Italian, to the Sicilian court. And it, it could be said that Sicily was never the same again. Um, so a very good question. Thank you for answering, asking it and I hope I've answered it. A bit. Thank you. Yes, so Charles, Charles, you've got a question. Um, two questions. Is, is Tancred then the first Holy Roman Empire ruler? And the second question is, what happened to the emirs? Were there, are there known to have been battles? Presumably the emirs just didn't give up. They will have had to have been deposed violently. Yes, yes, you're quite right. Um, okay, so let's, let's answer your second question first. The emirs, yes, they were, they were deposed by the, Norman, by the Norman knights, effectively. They turned against their, their own employers. Um, the the um, battles that, that actually happened, were, it was very, very interesting this because the Sicilian cities, notably Palermo, but also Enna, were very, very well defended. They were tended to be built up on the tops of hills. Um, the Norman knights, Roger and Robert and his men, were horsemen. They they had very tiny numbers, as I said. There was no way they could besiege these cities. They were very cunning. They drew the Arabs out of their cities uh, where they were vulnerable into the plains below and they just simply put them to the sword. They were very, very ruthless and very, very bloody. Um, some terrible stories <laughs> of what they did. And they, and they waged psychological warfare. So. What they also did was they um, they tore strips off the emir's clothing, beautiful clothing, dipped it in blood and sent it back to Palermo so that the people of Palermo knew that their emir had fallen. I mean, this was psychological warfare as much as anything. Um, the second part of your question, Tancredi, um, no, he was, he was the last Norman king he, he only had Norman blood. He didn't have any German blood in him. He was from another part of the family. Um, 
and he didn't i mean the, he didn't really even have a proper um proof to the crown it was disputed um and there was a certain that period in history the beginning of 1190 um was actually a time when richard the lionheart on his way to the um one of the crusades was in messina trying to negotiate um this passage of the crown and also because he was the, he was the brother of, the, of, of joanna and also to negotiate her escape so it was a very difficult piece of history there but tancredi never really had a, a, a big foothold in, in sicily at all no. thanks okay damien uh, hi uh, andrew uh, andrew andrew yes welcome um, yeah. damien you showed the progress of the norman invasion along the essentially the north coast from uh, Messina to Palermo and uh, I just wondered whether their influence was island-wide at the sort of peak of their career as it were. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, this passage from 1060 to 1070 uh, was very very laboured and slow. It really was one town at a time. Um, but once they arrived in Palermo, um, that was the very last uh, town to be conquered by the Normans. So by that time, it had become island-wide. So um, the, the last towns to be conquered by the Normans were places like Enna, which is right in the center of Sicily, Erice, which is right out in the west, and then also places down um, on the west coast, so places like Mazzara del Vallo. So they were conquered in 1069, really, the year before, um, before they arrived in Palermo. But by the, by the time they got to Palermo, it was island-wide. Palermo was very much the capital of, of Sicily at that time, yes. Okay, thank you. Good, yeah. Hey, Amen. Um, it's Angela here. Um, Angela, hello. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, <laughs> last week, when you were talking about the Roman villa, and you talked about um, the work being done largely by um, uh, craftsmen from North Africa who were brought over to do that, do we know anything about the people who actually executed the mosaics in the in the Norman cathedrals? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, we do, and um, and. Uh, I should I should have mentioned it. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, we do know that absolutely, and there is a story <laughs> that Roger the Second in the Palatine Chapel, when he was building the Palatine Chapel, he actually um, abducted some craftsmen, as it were, from Constantinople and brought them over to to work on the um, on the mosaics in the Palatine Chapel. Because um, at that time, Sicily had no tradition of Byzantine mosaics. There was nobody in Sicily that was able to do it. Um, now, the point about this is that we can recognize difference in craftsmanship in Monreale from the Palatine Chapel. And we think that by the time that Monreale Cathedral came to be built, it was made by local craftsmen and the craftsmanship isn't quite as fine as the craftsmanship of the Palatine Ch Chapel. Um, so we think that by that time, well also in sheer scale of numbers, they would not have been able to use um, craftsmen brought in from Constantinople to, to, to deck out the whole of Monreale in, in such a short space of time. They'd have had to have used local craftsmen. But um, there's another important point here as well, which I, which I didn't mention at all. Um, so we'd have had the Greek craftsmen working on the, um, on the mosaics. We'd have had the Arab craftsmen, of course, um, writing the beautiful calligraphy. And what I didn't have time to show you is that there is also some beautiful geometric mosaics around the outside of the walls of the cathedral. And that would have been done by local Arab craftsmen as well. So everybody would have been working on this project at the same time, completely regardless 
of their religion. Yes. So thank you for reminding me. Good question. I think we've got time for a couple more questions if uh, people want to fire away. Yes. Um, Damien, it's Geoffrey. Geoffrey, yes. Hello, wondering. Jeffrey. Yep. How linked up as an empire and as a people were the Normans? Because the Norman rule in Sicily seems to have been very tolerant and benevolent, whereas Norman rule in this country was brutal, repressive and very destructive. It seems as if they're two totally different things that had sort of no linkage between them. Yes, uh, that's, yes, that's, that's very, very good. Um, it's, it's, and it's a very interesting thing, actually. Uh, now, there's two sides to that. Um, first of all, the um, Norman family that, that arrived in Sicily, the, the Altavilla or Hauteville family, they were loosely related to the Normans that invaded Britain. So there was a connection there. Um, but, and you're absolutely right to, to identify these very two different rules. Now, I think it throws open lots and lots of questions. Um, Norman rule in Sicily is, is always said to be very, very tolerant. And probably it was to, to an extent, um, but one just doesn't know how much that is us portraying it and how much, you know, it really was on the ground. I have a feeling that the Normans in Sicily were absolutely ruthless as well. And they were ruthless with each other. I mean, we have stories of, um, of the Normans, you know, there was a Norman coup at one stage, some Norman barons um, uh, rose up against each other and they all got put to the sword. So they certainly weren't tolerant of each other. Um, but I think the other clue in all of this is simply in numbers. Um, I think the Normans in Sicily simply didn't have the numbers to be able to, to rule in the same way as the Normans did in, in, um, in, 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 in Britain. And also the other thing was that, and I think I mentioned this, the Normans in Sicily tended to marry um, sort of foreign aristocracy, foreign princesses. So some of them, one of the princesses was from Spain, one of them was from Northern Italy. So there was, there was already this very much more multicultural kind of um, feel to the Norman families in themselves. So, so what I really want to say is, is that the families themselves would have spoken um, Italian, they would have spoken fr French, they would have spoken Spanish and so on. So they would have been much more tolerant even within the families of themselves. So difficult to know exactly the answer, but I hope that goes some way to, to uh, putting forward an idea. Anybody else? Let's have one more question just to finish off. Anybody going to offer a question? Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to ask a question. Um, yes, go what, ahead. The written languages obviously were Latin, Greek and Arabic. What were the spoken languages? Um, yes, yes. So as it were, the lingua franca, um, it would have been all of those languages all together. Um, and of course Not it would have varied. From, from town to town, and it would have been varied um, who, who, who was speaking to who. And the other language that we haven't really mentioned yet is Hebrew, of course, would have, would have been spoken. Um, and, and there is evidence of, of that in, not very much, it has to be said, but there is some evidence around um, Sicily. I think it's true to say that, that Latin um, would be very much a language of the church, I think. I think. Um, so there have been sort of primitive Italian, Greek, Arabic, uh, Norman French, uh, Hebrew, as I say, um, all thrown into this melting pot together. And that's why Sicilian dialect today is so fascinating because it contains vestiges of all these languages spoken all together. Um, and, and that's why Sicily is really kind of a, um, a melting pot for, for all that went on in, in medieval Europe. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Well, we have gone slightly over time, so I think I'm going to have to leave off here. But thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, thank you so much, Damien. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, oh, thank you, Ken. Ken. <laughs> um,
nice to see you all now next week's talk uh, just before we finally leave off is on the carthaginians now the carthaginians didn't leave us wonderful churches like the normans did but their story is absolutely fascinating the story of trade in the carthaginian times is second to none so we're going to go and we're going to uncover some of the secrets of um, what happened to the carthaginians in in Sicily. Sicily. So until then, <laughs> we'll stay out of bias and thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Take, a, take care in Australia, in Melbourne, look out in your lockdown and raise another glass of wine to us. <laughs> Thanks very much, Damien. Uh, all right, see you then, Roger. We'll be in touch. Take care. All the very best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's lovely, wasn't it?